Hi, Surya. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Who's here? Hi, Hi Katarina. Is it over? Dobro, ti. Super, da, da. Super, baš se radim da ste prihvatili da učestvujete na ovome. Hvala tebi na pozivu. Naravno. Neko, gde nam je, ko nam fali? Nikolo? Fali nam Nikolo. Nikolo. Žalost je tu. A... Gordan, ne znam koliko minuti čiti. Ja mislim da počneme. Imamo je način da go iskontaktirame? Ja ki probam na Messenger da go načnem, a ti počnete s intrata, pošto više se snima i odi live, da ne gubeme vrema, a ja ki go podbocnem na mislimče da ga podsjetam, da ne je nešto u neka druga vremenska zona ili ne znam. Iako mislim da ko u pari žive, treba da je tu. Ajde se ga kemo pričam. Ajde. Ok, ok. Dear friends, dear participants, it is my pleasure to host you on this online event with a very, I would say, devilish title. Uh, we will have to decipher it at some point uh, during the debate. I hope that the, uh, the panelists will try to do that. The, the name of the title of the topic is Authoritarian Bending of Eurotechnocracy, Illiberalism's Devil in the Details in Southeastern Europe, the case of North Macedonia. Uh, this is part of a, a series uh, of panel uh, panels organized by the Institute uh, of Social Science of Humanities Skopje uh, in our in, in our let's say wider context of uh, first coining and then deciphering and then elaborating the the concept of capture state, uh, which used to be uh, uh, primarily targeted towards the authoritarian clearly authoritarian regime of Nikola Gruevski, but it has spread like authoritarianism. Uh, spread all over and now it is kind of a uh, catchphrase or a concept which has some some meaning some 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 let's say deeper meaning for for the wider region of the western balkans uh i would say even beyond having in mind uh, what is happening in uh, uh in this duality of liberal and illiberal uh europe we are we are witnessing today um uh, we are making this debate at the most, let's say, I would say, at the most cynical intersection in the in the Macedonia's uh, uh, path towards the European Union. I, I dare to say, uh, Western Balkans, the most cynical intersection of Western Balkans' path towards the, the European Union. But uh, probably we'll discuss that in details uh, throughout the debate. Uh, we are in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of EU. Uh, Kind of a for the for the, I don't know tenth twentieth uh, time reinventing itself, trying to reinvent itself, and uh, I'll I, I'll dare to say in the midst of the grand return of the nation state uh, in the in the European Union, on the detriment uh, of uh, some kind of wider and deeper regional uh, in the European Union sense or the in 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 other aspects regional integrations. Uh, the support for 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 enlargement in the country, uh, maybe Kajalski will will, will 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 say more about that, uh, is uh, at its lows. Uh, I don't know if it's at its uh, ever lows, but uh, there is a clear cynicism uh, in Macedonia towards uh, our a never-ending path toward uh, towards EU integration or starting the uh, the negotiations. Uh, for the EU. Uh, and normally citizens in, in this country are asking themselves their, that question. What, what is the point? Uh, where do we go from this point on? What is, what is next? Is there any plan B, plan C, plan D for the country and for the region? Because you, you can, we cannot uh, evolve the country from the region. Uh, this series of panels, uh, 
are part of a, a, a project called the new challenges in the overcoming of democratic backsliding in North Macedonia. State capture and new liberal democracy revisited in an emerging context. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of uh, aspects in, in, the, in the very title of the projects. Uh, first, the presuppos presupposition that actually we are still in kind of a democratic backsliding and that uh, the, 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 the idea of the state capture is still prevalent in the country, maybe not on the, on the surface or on the uh, highest level in the on the political elite, uh, but for sure in this mid to lower term uh, uh, aspects of the society. Uh, the project is supported by the National Endowment for Democracy uh, and it seeks to analyze uh, in a way the public policies and examine the underlying principles in lawmaking and in implementation in terms of their adherence to the European chapter, uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights, focusing on two issues of, in particular, which, which are important for, uh, for Macedonian citizens and the European citizens alike. First one is the placement or the, the, the position of the citizen uh, or the uh, citizen-centered uh, aspect of, the, of, of their dealing with the administration, with the bureaucracy, let's say. Uh, and uh, the second one, the right to good administration is one of the fundamental rights and principles guaranteed by, by the Charter of Fundament, European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, we can say that the, we are far from that since we haven't started uh, the, uh, the negotiations process. Uh, but uh, when we were trying to decipher the, the underlying principles or the underlying motives uh, of capturing of the state, uh, when, we, when we, we analyzed that and discussed this on the macro, on a ground level in the country, uh, then we got to some kind of a perverse situation uh, and, uh, and we were analyzing one mantra by the European uh, bureaucrats uh, uh, or European officials who for, uh, even during the time of uh, Gruevski's regime and still prevalent now, uh, had this kind of small uh, sentence that actually Macedonia's, uh, Macedonia's laws or legislations are good, but we have a bad implementation. And we kind of incorporated this kind of mantra uh, in the sense that, okay, we have good European laws, but uh, we have bad implementation. What is the problem with that? Actually, uh, when, when, we, when we went deep down and drowned down in this context, uh, we will see that actually uh, these uh, good laws could be, uh, could be uh, superposed uh, in, in virtually every territory, every country. But the, the, uh, what lacks the implementations, the very essence of, the, of implementing or uh, doing the public policies is lacking. And of course, we understand that there are a lot of reasons behind that. Uh, chronism, chron chronism, political party, um, um, clientelism, et cetera, et cetera. So illiberal practices, uh, uh, tribal, tribal interfering, uh, let's say, be, uh, between the political elites or political parties, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in that sense, we are producing, we produce a couple of uh, policy papers, uh, some of them very, going very deep into the essence of the, uh, how, how, how a citizen or a client in the, in the let's say, in the new uh, neoliberal um, vocabulary, a client uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is supposed to behave in front of a, such a huge leviathan as, as, as a state bureaucracy or state administration. And what are the, uh, the paths uh, so, so they get their rights or, or their services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in that sense, uh, the Institute uh, uh, continues its effort uh, to work on this kind of decapturing de the state institutions by working on projects, uh, let's say variety or wide, wider projects aimed at depolarization of the political climate, which is still poisoned, even a couple of years after Gruevski is, is going in Budapest, uh, then creating kind of assumptions or hard variables for wider social reconciliation, as well as uh, permanently kind of combating, combating the populist
Uh, Gurda, we are not hearing you. Gordon, ma slušašte? Ne? A, Rista? A. Rista, mislim, da ti imaš mute krano sve živo. Ne, 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 mute not. Dobro, aj. Dvore? Gordon, probaj sega. Ok, same system. Ok, calls. Does it mean that you, uh, you haven't heard anything I said? No, just the couple of sentences before I called you the last time no, I can hear you we could not just toward the end right no, I before I called you. you uh sorry can you hear me again oh my god yes now now, now it sounds okay. good okay does it mean that I talked for 10 minutes and nobody heard anything no, no, just the last 30 seconds before I called you. Okay, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, so, um, uh, sorry again for this, uh, okay, again, uh, COVID-related problems. Um, uh, okay, today's, uh, uh, today's uh, debate or panel, um, I will host uh, four very important uh, people who, 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 will, who will discuss, uh, let's say, if we say that the focus on, on this debate will be uh, Macedonia is kind of a case study, uh, a prominent case study, I would say in a negative sense about uh, uh, what doesn't constitute a capture state. Uh, we will have uh, another aspect by Chaun uh, uh, with the with the Bosnian aspect of the state capture uh, with a, let's say, a, a knowledgeable title, let process led by the tribe leaders and the system of privileges that made uh, that they made for themselves, which will be kind of a, a relational to the Macedonian case. Um, then we'll have Alessandra Kajalovsky with the culture of corruption, tolerance in public administration um, from uh, Macedonian Center for International Cooperation, uh, uh, a venerable institution in Macedonia, which made actually a couple of analysis, in-depth analysis about this culture of corruption tolerance in Macedonian public administration. We will finish with uh, Nikola Milanese, I hope he's here, uh, with these devilish details and layers of the inferno, uh, uh, a wider topic on the European illiber illiberalism from micro to, uh, to macro. Uh, but first we will start uh, uh, with our friend and, uh, and a known uh, a spectator and uh, analyst uh, on the Western uh, Balkans and the Southeastern Europe uh, in general. Uh, it's a Florian Bieber, who is a professor of Southeast European history and politics and director of the uh, known, uh, uh, well-known center for Southeastern uh, European studies at the University of Graz in Austria. Uh, professor Bieber will, uh, uh, will have his words on the topic, the lingering legacy of competitive authoritarianism conceptualizing and capturing uh, 
the state and redemocratization, which already the title uh, presupposed that we are far from uh, decapturing and democratizations of the uh, of the uh, regional southeastern Europe. Uh, Pro Professor Biber, the floor is yours, if you can hear me. Thanks, thanks, Gordon. I can I can hear you very well, and I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm glad. Thanks for the invitation, and. Um, uh, when when uh, I was discussing with Katarina to to participate, uh, I was thinking hard about what I could say productive on the topic, and uh, uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about the case of uh, North Macedonia or um, any particular country case study, but rather think about how uh, one can think about this issue of the legacy of competitive authoritarianism, because I think. Of course, there are many terms used, uh, captured states, uh, authoritarianism, competitive authoritarianism. Um, I, th I find this uh, the term of competitive authoritarianism appropriate for the kind of regimes we've seen under Gruevsky in, Mac in Macedonia, uh, what we are seeing uh, under Alexander Vucic in Serbia, or uh, Amilo Djukanovic in Montenegro, and to a lesser degree also in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where there's a kind of a, a more complicated picture, and I guess we'll hear more uh, from Harun about that. But the, the point is that um, what I want to think about is that there's been a lot of debate in recent years about this democratic backsliding and the rise of these systems, but there's been very little discussion about what comes after those regimes. And I think this is what this initiative inspired me to think about a little bit. Um, namely, there is um, an uh, unspoken assumption that once these regimes end, that there will be a return to something democratic. Um, and that, you know, that basically there is some kind of like, you just have to uncapture the, the state um, and uh, end a competitive authoritarianism. And then we're back to where we were before these uh, types of regimes have risen. And I think there, there, there are reasons to doubt this. Um, um, the first reason to doubt this is that, um, of course, the, the experience of North Macedonia of recent years shows that it's not such an easy switch on, switch off. A regime falls and everything is returning to a democrat democratic ideal. Um, it's also, of course, in a larger uh, context of uh, European context of these regimes being quite entrenched and hard to challenge. Um, so I think it's it's not as, as simple as a switch. Um, of course, it never is. Um, so I think there, there, if we disc, if we conceptualize um, competitive authoritarian regimes, I would point forward, would look at three elements of them. Um, one is the regime itself. So the particular political party and leadership. Um, this might be a particular prime minister, or president, Krievsky, Djukanovic, Vucic, Dodik, uh, Orban, Erdogan, and the names uh, continue, which are associated with them. Um, and political parties which are affiliated with them. Of course, we uh, would be naive to imagine that just the end of any of those particular names would end automatically the nature of the regime uh, completely. And that brings me to the structural elements. So all of them have a structural uh, basis. Um, and uh, even before they came to power, um, be it in Turkey, be it in Hungary, be it in Macedonia or Serbia, um, there were structural institutional weaknesses which both made them possible, but also which they could draw on and reinforce. So they usually did not transform, uh, let's say, what you would consider to be fully consolidated liberal democracies into competitive authoritarian systems, but rather they did this transformation in a context where they where the system had already weaknesses. I mean, examples in Serbia are that, you know, the president uh, had already before Vucic or Tomislav Nikolic took office, had uh, a, a super presidential system under Boris Tadic, for example, um, in the late 2000s, where he subordinated the power of the government to the presidency, even though constitutionally, this is not uh, in line with the understanding of the Serbian constitution. Um, now, this wasn't yet competitive authoritarianism, but this was the structural uh, foundations of these systems. So they preceded competitive authoritarianism, and thus there's no reason to believe that they will come to an end once that uh, regime uh, ends in itself. So they are what I could, would consider to be, um, uh, first of all, institutional uh, institutional legacies which precedes these regimes and which likely continue. So uh, in that sense, it's not just about the regime, but it's about the institutional elements. 
And these are structured in multiple ways. First of all, there is what is called often what I would call institutional resistance to change. So you have, uh, if you have institutions based on competitive authoritarianism, they often have uh, self-interest to maintain uh, elements of state capture um, and competitive authoritarianism, because you know, if you think about hiring practices, uh, people are are hired based on party loyalty, not on competence, and all of that. So. The, their their behavior and expectation will not change once the regime itself ends. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is that um, uh, incumbent parties would often find what you could call the well, you know, the comfortable chair of authoritarian rule. That it's very tempting to use some of the same mechanisms um, to continue ruling afterwards. And this might not even be uh, uh, this might not even be shared by everybody in that new uh, authorities, but some might use those mechanisms or even um, uh, use them for good intent. I mean, the classic example is that there was a law in Serbia which uh, gave it overriding power over the Yugoslav constitution, which was used by the uh, government in 2001, uh, Zoran Djinjic government, to extradite Slobodan Milosevic against the will of Vojstav Kostunica at the federal level, which was probably a good decision, but it was a law imposed by Slobodan Milosevic um, to override uh, Yugoslav uh, concerns in 1990. Um, so you can see how these laws and rules and patterns and ways of doing things uh, linger on beyond um, the authoritarian or competitive authoritarian regimes. And they might be, of course, very tempting to use. Um, so we have the kind of institutional resistance to democratization or transformation. We have the legacies which are comfortable for the new uh, uh, place, uh, new, you know, power holders. So these are structural elements which precede competitive authoritarianism and which, uh, which uh, continue after their, their end. And then the third element to think about is also the external, um, what I would call the external disincentive structure. Um, you know, studies of democratization have often argued that uh, democratization is easier if there's an external incentive structure, both rewards if you live in a democratic neighborhood, um, all of those elements, uh, which of course in the, in the current circumstance is not the case. So if you're living in, an, in a competitive authoritarian neighborhood, uh, this is not a strong uh, incentive to transform. And you know, if we take uh, the situation where we have um, in the European Union at least two um, if not more countries which have outright competitive authoritarian elements. And I would say, you know, in addition to Poland and Hungary, which are often mentioned, Slovenia has been displaying some features in recent year over the last year uh, under the government of Janis Jansha. We can say the Boyko Borisov government in Bulgaria has also some of those elements. So it's well beyond a particular uh, or any single country. And of course, that is a disincentivization. So, you know, unlike, let's say, um, if you take compared to the kind of competitive authoritarianism of Vladimir Mecha in Slovakia in the 1990s, where he was seen as an outlier in the countries aspiring to join the European Union, um, the pressure was very easily focused on him. While now, if you're saying, well, who is the competitive authoritarian leader in, uh, uh, and, and regime in Europe, uh, it's diffused because there are so many of them. Um, so in that sense, there's quite a, in a certain way, it diffuses it and it makes the pressure against any single one of them a lot, a lot uh, weaker. So I think there's an external disincentive structure. So this is briefly how to conceptualize, I think, this, uh, that, that we should not just focus when we're talking about uh, a competitive authoritarianism, just about a particular leader and the party which keep them in power, but there's a larger structure around them. And dismantling those kind of regimes is much more than just one particular party and leader. Of course, they are the precondition, but they are not the end to this process. So I think there are a couple of, um, there are a couple of um, flaws in the paradigm of dealing with this, because first of all, um, we still, I think, or often the assumptions are going back to the 1990s about how to think about democracy and uh, and authoritarianism. So there's a there's still still this idea, I think, often in debates, that um, that there is this uh, clear dichotomy between democracy and non-democracy. 
um, and I think this is the you know, very important observation, of course, already by using the term competitive authoritarianism, that it's not a bi binary, but it's a continuum. And so in that sense, there's, we all live in zones of gray. Um, and that, of course, makes it a lot more difficult to determine when a country is no longer competitive authoritarian and when it is becoming, let's say, more democratic. It's not a, a, a switch. And so I think one has to, first of all, uh, overcome the binary understanding uh, of, of democracy and non-democracy. It still doesn't mean that there's certainly a point among this continuum when a country ceases to be democratic and becomes more authoritarian, but it's not um, a point in time which can be easily identified. And movement in each direction is often gradual and not like a switch. The second point is that um, the idea of a clear and fixed end goal, that there is this clear liberal democratic system to aspire to, and that this is the, the target, the idea of transformation, or as it used to be known in the 90s, transition, um, is something which is uh, one has to continue to, to, to challenge, because again, um, this is not something which is uh, automatically going to come as often as assumed. So, so I think still it's often the assumption that if these leaders are removed, then the country will kind of automatically shift towards liberal democracy, that this is in a certain way the natural progression, in a certain way a very optimistic um, understanding of change. And I think this un optimistic understanding of change has to be um, question. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that the that uh, we have to endorse a pessimistic uh, understanding of change that everything will uh, decline. And in recent years, maybe there's been sometimes this understanding that everything democracy is declining and degrading. Again, these are none of these are um, predetermined historical processes, but they're based on a certain confluence of factors. So we can't say, uh, you know, everything is moving towards democracy or everything is moving away from democracy, but um, certainly there isn't this clear fixed end goal. And I think uh, in the narratives, but also in the kind of understanding of the 90s and 2000s, there was often this understanding that there is this clear goal of moving towards a liberal democratic European Union integration kind of um, process and direction. And I think that kind of linear understanding where authoritarianism is just a disruptor to this is, uh, is not very helpful because it's not a disruption, um, but it's part of the pro it's included in the process. You can be authoritarian and a member of the European Union. Um, now, there are lots of the European Union who might be critical towards it, but it's still a reality of, of what is going on. So um, that also means that this kind of clear a package of liberal democracy, EU integration, um, and uh, and also with it market uh, economy, this kind of package does not hold. It was criticized already back then, but I think we've seen it more clearly that you can have a competitive authoritarian system which functions in a European liberal market uh, economy very well. You know, Hungary is a perfect example. In fact, its survival depends on both EU funding as well as support of, let's say, the German car industry. So there's a kind of, it's embedded in a particular market economy which coexists with liberal democracy in one country and competitive authoritarian in another. another. And it's in fact a lot easier to survive as a competitive authoritarian system if you're able to embed yourself into this broader system which is in fact looks uh, liberal democratic uh, in, in many of its components but not in all of them. Um, so this also means that the incentive structure has changed. So um, in the past you could say the clear incentive structure and Gordon was already alluding to it in the, in the negative case for North Macedonia of course the, the blockages, the, the, the never ending story of EU integration is of course a disincentive because you don't see the relation between effort and reward um, between you know, a transformation internally or attempted transformation and uh, any kind of reward in terms of EU integration because you can get blocked over frivolous issues such as we've seen in the case of Bulgaria Bulgaria recently against uh, North Macedonia. But it's not only that, it's also that we have, you know, of course, if we have uh, an EU commissioner like uh, the current commissioner in charge of enlargement from a competitive authoritarian regime talking about rule of law in uh, North Macedonia or in Serbia while uh, his government is hiding or providing asylum to um, the competitive authoritarian leader of uh, Macedonia um, in Budapest, then of course, this is not a very uh, clear incentive structure. You know, what is the message you're sending in that particular case? So I think this is the other problem of the paradigm that EU integration is the, is the incentive which clearly guides and provides guidelines 
uh, how to get out of um, competitive authoritarian systems. So this this is, I think, some of the critiques of the paradigms. Now, so so what do we have to think about um, when we want to challenge or kind of question um, the you know this lingering legacy of these systems? Um, and I want to make four points to to wrap up with. And again, all of these are preliminary thoughts. I don't think there's you know there hasn't been much conceptualization of this, and I just want to kind of in, in kind of uh, put kick off some thinking about this that uh, how to think about this kind of post competitive authoritarian legacies and, and, and deal with them. So the first one uh, is what I would call the issue of citizen support. Um, and I've, uh, I've last year co authored a paper with uh, Miran Lavrich, which was based on several opinion polls, which found that in the Western Balkans support for what you could consider to be competitive authoritarianism had increased over the last 15, 20 years. Now, what does that look like? Citizen support actually means often people who are both in favor of strong leaders, and they are in classical survey questions which talk about, you know, do you support a leader who, who can disregard parliament or, you know, who, who is able to enforce his will, while at the same time people are supporting democracy as the main political system. So people are not supporting authoritarianism, but they're supporting democracy with a strong leader. Uh, and that, of course, if you take that together, is exactly what competitive authoritarianism is. It's formal democracy with leadership which disregards democratic rules. Um, now, we argue that it's not that these leaders are strong um, in many several countries of the Western Balkans because citizens support them, but rather that citizens support them because they are strong. Now, this sounds like a paradox, but um, I think they are in a certain way producing, they're, they're manufacturing support for their regime type. Um, how? Um, because uh, they've been systematically undermining um, their, the, the kind of appreciation of liberal democracy, for example, by undermining the work of parliament. Um, parliament has been systematically kind of undermined from multiple directions uh, across the region, which maybe makes it look like a, like a, a, like a, a place of... Um, mockery and, and 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 so it kind of creates a lack of appreciation of the institution um, and often um, also independent institutions which are also an important part of, of uh, democracy which protect the rights of non dominant opinions and groups uh, have been undermined so it kind of the system has been much more a target towards um, the decision making of one single person um, and that kind of and citizen support for democracy is often declined or become more conditional, not because uh, uh, they actually live in a democracy, but because they live in a flawed democracy. So it's the flawed democracy which undermines belief in democracy. Um, but of course, it's exactly this flawed democracy which undermines support for democracy. If I were living in Serbia, I would also become skeptical about democracy if people tell me that I'm living in a democracy because I don't see it delivering. But of course, the problem is not that it's a ill-functioning Ill democracy, but that it's a author competitive authoritarian system. What basically I'm trying to say here is that um, citizens, uh, citizens are skeptical about democracy because they live in a competitive authoritarian system, which pretends to be a democracy. And this is, of course, the, the fundamental problem, conceptual problem of competitive authoritarianism. They all claim to be democratic. Uh, they don't claim to be authoritarian. So, um, and they, they, they rule authoritarian in the name of democracy. And of course, this undermines democracy and it helps them to survive to some degree. So this is what I would call the mudding of democratic waters. It's very hard to understand what democracy actually means and what it should look like and what people believe. And of course, the result of that is also fundamental distrust in the institutions of democracy. I mean, we find that, you know, trust in democracy, the more democratic the institutions are in most countries of the Western Balkans, um, the less trust they enjoy. Parliament has usually least trust. And I mean, I'm generalizing, I know there's lots of variation, um, but often the undemocratic institutions like army or uh, uh, churches or religious communities enjoy more trust than the institutions which should have more democratic legitimacy like parliament, uh, government, and so on. So that's 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 a challenge of, of citizen support. Another challenge of ch tackling these regimes is, is the role of informality, which I think we have to be aware of. So um, and I think this is why also this the, the EU uh, and the EU integration for all the other flaws it has is particularly challenged by this because it's not rule based competitive authoritarianism. The, None of the country, unlike Hungary which, and Turkey, which did change their constitutions to suit the regime type, 
none of the competitive authoritarian regimes in the Western Balkans fundamentally changed the constitution to rule in a competitive authoritarian way. You don't need to do that. In fact, a lot of it happens informally. So, you know, um, Montenegro, Serbia, Macedonia, none of them changed their constitutions in a fundamental way. Um, uh, but you could have both democratic and more or less democratic and competitive authoritarian regimes with, exist within them because they ruled informally. So the problem is that, of course, the European Union as a rule-based organization has a really hard time providing guidance for non-rule-based authoritarianism, or if, let's say, not formal rule-based. So, of course, this is why compliance is easy for these competitive authoritarian regimes often, because they can, um, they can set the rules to be formally all right. Um, you have independent institutions on paper. Everybody knows they're not independent, but um, it's not because of them, of the legal restrictions, but because of informal uh, ways of subverting it. And of course, undoing informal rules is a lot harder than undoing formal rules because it's not about changing laws. You can change the laws a hundred times uh, and still have those informal practices. So this is why it's also very hard to get out of this because um, informal rules, first of all, uh, cannot be changed by laws. They cannot be changed by democratic product, uh, pr uh, processes. Um, they can be changed basically through behavioral change. And that is much harder to measure. It's much harder to change. And it's much easier to use because uh, you can get away with it a lot more. Uh, and then the fourth point uh, I would mention here and how to think about confronting it is, of course, this, what I've mentioned earlier, the symbiotic relationship between state capture uh, and EU integration. Um, that basically we find that these state capturers uh, or competitive authoritarian regimes are not anti-European in their rhetoric, in their self-proclaimed position. So um, they all claim to be pro-European and they all claim to uh, adhere to EU integration. And exactly they can do that because they're playing this double game of formal democracy, formal EU integration and informal opposite. And this is of course an inherent you know, paradox of their rule, which makes it very hard for them to sustain it, but it's a worthwhile effort because the informal rule means they can stay in power. The formal commitment to EU integration means that they can uh, um, secure external legitimacy. And they have been able to do so for a decade, basically, if not more, um, partly because of the lack of commitment of the EU towards enlargement, partly because of the rise of authoritar competitive authoritarianism in the European Union itself, um, and partly because um, there's this skepticism about enlargement and it makes it kind of certainly creates a willing partner on the other side. But the, the bottom line is that with this relationship, of course, um, state capture becomes associated with EU integration. So in a certain way, um, to be an effective critic of Alexander Vucic in Serbia now, you, it's very hard to be a pro-European critic of Alexander Vucic because you are actually, uh, you know, you, you are confronted with image of him with EU leaders who say he is a, a big hope. So it basically then, uh, and I think this is a kind of a question beyond. Um, we, we see similarly in, in Montenegro, the, the government of Milo Djukanovic fell in the end because it messed with the Serbian Orthodox Church. I mean, to put it simply, it's a bit more complicated, but um, so in a certain way, the critique of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Montenegrin regime, it didn't, feel, it didn't fall because it was not European enough not reformist enough. It fell because it reduced the power of the Serbian Orthodox Church. Now we can discuss, decide how we think about that, but it certainly was a conservative rebellion which brought the end of that government. Um, now the coalition is, is complicated and you can have a, a diverse opinion about it, but it suggests also that it's very hard to challenge these regimes from a liberal uh, pro-European perspective because of the symbiotic relationship. And of course, this then raises the question whether those new uh, replacements of these regimes aren't just as illiberal or differently illiberal than the previous ones. And so in a certain way, this kind of, you know, the, 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 the dichotomy we had in the 1990s, maybe I'll say, you know, you have the anti-European nationalist uh, autocrats uh, on one side and the pro-European democratic uh, 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 liberals on the other side, this dichotomy doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it never existed in the 1990s. I mean, it didn't exist in such a clear cut way, but this is the certain way, the interpretive framework which existed back then, which doesn't exist today anymore.
and of course this makes this whole process a lot more more complicated so I'm going to end here. I'm, uh, again, th these are just some preliminary thoughts about how to think about this topic, um, and uh, and you know, um, I guess we can then we can discuss how this applies to different countries and, and whether we can discern some general uh, patterns. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I captured a lot of uh, aspects that we can uh, we can discuss further on and. I'll, uh, I'll I'll come back to uh, to this aspect stated by Professor Bieber. Uh, now we can go to uh, let's say the most uh, famous uh, capture state uh, in Europe, the Bosnian state capture, or the process led by the tribe leaders and the system of privilege that uh, they made for themselves. Uh, um, Harun Tevo, who is a political scientist uh, and a journalist uh, with a special focus on South. Uh, East Europe, uh, uh, Harun, please, uh, will you give us uh, your statement on this? Uh, uh, we, you can also relate it to, to some of the theses uh, that Professor Bieber mentioned, because my idea is at the end of the day, at the end of the, the panel, to, to wrap them up and to discuss them in, a, uh, in their totality, because uh, I, I suspect that they will be correlated. Mm -hmm. uh, Harun, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gordon. Uh, thank you for having me here. So um, I'm uh, I just just to mention I'm the project manager at the uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation uh, South Dialogue Southeast Europe uh, uh, State uh, Centered in. South but at, at this point uh, I will be speaking in my name, and not in the name of uh, our foundation, especially when it comes uh, to Bosnia. So as you, Gordon, already mentioned, my brief presentation is really dedicated to Bosnia and Herzegovina and the problems that the country is uh, dealing with in terms of uh, liberalism and further democratization. But nonetheless, I, at the beginning, I would like to highlight some uh, things that are also connected to the uh, regional level. So it is, in my opinion, a big question of reforms and politics of condi conditionality uh, bring bring you know lead us to to real democratization of 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 the society but this is something that we maybe can uh, as you said gordon uh, discuss um, later on i mean of course reforms are important uh, uh, that is no question but my question is are they really an end in itself, especially when it comes to the to the region, uh, uh, to our region, the region of the Western Western Balkans. So we at FES uh, SOI last year started with a project called Western Balkans Perspectives on the Future of Europe. And one of the goals of this project, project is to involve all layers of the society in the Western Balkans in the discussions about the future and the reform of the European Union. I mentioned this at the beginning because projects like these open ways uh, for rethinking illiberal um, democracy uh, uh, in Europe. So it is also, in my opinion, not entirely fair to hypothesize about democratic backsliding in North Macedonia just because of the EU integration process, but that similar developments are ignored in member states such, such as, uh, for example, Poland. Also a good example here on which we also maybe can elaborate uh, a, a, bit more, a bit later in the discussion is the comparison with the current uh, reform-oriented uh, government in North Macedonia with the uh, government uh, or with the achievements of Croatia, which has also not so long uh, been uh, a part of the EU and the status of democracy in that country uh, today. But like I said, uh, it is it is maybe maybe we can we can talk about this uh, 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 later on in the discussion. But today, uh, as I said, I will focus uh, on Bosnia. So it can be said that in terms of political structures, Bosnia is a sense of uh, and it is a very important case. That what that is why why I I, I picked. Bosnia and why I wanted to combine it 
so to say, with with North Ma North Macedonia and this this uh, the study that you, that you sent us and and the the, the whole well, agenda of of of, of this of this uh, panel uh, discussion. So Bosnia is basically a mixture of other regional country systems, or better to say, it has elements of all those um, systems. The only thing that is, I would say, different is the role and the approach of the international community in the country, which is very much different in Bosnia than uh, it is in other countries in the Western Balkans uh, region, in my opinion. Um, so the historical perspective is very important when it comes to illiberalism in Bosnia. Um, prior to post-war democratization in Bosnia and the region, uh, substantive experiences vis-a-vis -vis parliamentary or representative uh, democracy were extremely limited, as also Florian mentioned. I mean, even in Serbia, where parliamentary practices coexisted in the framework of, let's say, nominal uh, constitutional democracy, the regime skewed implicitly and explicitly towards autocracy. Bosnia, in contrast, had well-developed oligarchic norms, which took deep root during the Ottoman period, but were, they were also fundamentally preserved during the Austro-Hungarian period. And afterwards, only mutated in so much as they took an explicitly ethno-sectarian um, framework. In Bosnia, as in the region, a uh, 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 liberal con conception of citizenship, rights, and government governance was a marginal phenomenon, and that's that is also a thing that was mentioned by by, by Florian. And the, I mean, the first meaningful exp experiments with uh, with it did not begin to occur until uh, the post Yugoslav and post war period in Bosnia. If we're uh, uh, if we're more uh, precise, uh, since 1996, I would say. However, um, Bosnia's contemporary electoral and uh, parliamentary regime is a continuation of both authoritarian and um, oligarchic practices of the past. The Dayton regime, which comes from the uh, from the constitution, from, from the Dayton Agreement, I think uh, everybody uh, knows what the Dayton uh, Agreement is. If not, we will we will uh, we can discuss it uh, later on, and or I can I can give a, a short uh, a short definition. Uh, so the Dayton regime is fundamentally, in my opinion, fundamentally illiberal. So. Uh, it emphasizes sectarian accommodation rather than uh, a liberal, liberal democracy, and uh, it is, in my opinion, as easy as 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 that. So, indeed, one could argue that um, consultationalism, as such, is in itself inherently in, illiberal, and uh, and that it stresses and promotes collective rights over individual rights. I mean, quite naturally, such a regime has also stunted the development in Bosnia of other key of the other key pillar of a functional uh, liberal regime a market economy or better say a social uh, market uh, economy so because oligarchy prevails in both the country's politics and economics uh, clientelism and patrimonialism are uh, unfortunately um, the norm so the problem in Bosnia um, uh, is such that corruption, quote unquote corruption, only barely describes um, the scale of the problem. The ex actually existing political econ economy of Bosnia is fundamentally kleptocratic. Uh, there's no separate, better, uh, so to say, system is being corrupted per se. So, um, uh, and maybe uh, to go back to the beginning of the uh, of the presentation, in the canon of contem contemporary illiberal regimes, Bosnia is perhaps unique in that it is a constitutional re regime designed to be illiberal, yet designed and strengthened by some of the world's leading uh, liberal democratic regimes. So the central problem of the contemporary Bosnian state, in my opinion, 
is how to build the nece necessary domestic and international coalitions to begin the process of substantive liberalization and democratization. Um, absent such an effort, uh, Bosnia will continue along its uh, existing entropic uh, path. I hate, it. I hate to say that, but uh, it will devolve from mere illiberalism to outright authoritarianism. See um, Milorad Dodik, uh, who uh, the leader of the SNSD and the member of the presidency of, 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 of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So um, that is the one side of the medal, I would, I would say. Uh, and maybe to simplify it a bit, um, the right approach of the international community in this sense is um, very much important. So until now, the praxis in Bosnia was that basically everything is discussed behind closed doors. There's a lack of citizens forums um, or even referendums when it comes to big questions or even smaller questions uh, who, where usually the citizens in a, yeah, in a normal country, the citizens could, could maybe also have a chance to decide what the priorities also as regards to reforms are for them. So what do they actual, actual, actually see as, as important for them, for, for, for their lives, basically, uh, not just on, 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 on the local levels, but also on, on the country level. Uh, I mean, a good example here is, 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 is the budget, which, which is actually determined with no real discussion. What the priorities are, where to, to, to you know, to, to, to put money. Uh, so it, it, it isn't really, the budget isn't really a part of a, uh, this, this, of a discussion in, in, in the in Bosnia society as such. Uh, but also, mm -mm, referendums and citizens forums that I mentioned can be re also relevant for bigger constitutional questions like the discussions around the April package of constitutional reform that is now uh, hotter than ever, I, I would say. Um, uh, but that, that is also a thing that can, that can maybe uh, be discussed in, later on or in, in, in another, on another panel. Uh, so, or, or the Mostar agreement through which the elections in that city could be held after first, after 12 years. And I wrote uh, an opinion piece on that uh, in, 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 uh, for the Western, uh, for the Balkan, Balkan Insight. Uh, so that, that are all questions on which the citizens, so on which the citizens uh, of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and are, and, uh, are, and, uh, are unable to give, uh, to give their, their opinion on, on that. So, so um, I think that definitely these and similar questions should be questions of referenda or citizen, uh, citizen forums. Uh, the most important thing, and I think that is basically when I said at the beginning that the approach of the international community is different in, in Bosnia, or a slight or bit, a bit different, maybe not completely, but uh, I think in Bosnia, this, this closed doors policy uh, should be definitely uh, uh, changed. So uh, the political processes should be definitely given back to the institutions and their I mean, making deals with with the so-called as as the title of of, of the of the of the presentation uh, says, tribe leaders, and leading processes through these leaders uh, doesn't doesn't bring uh, any effect, or it it, it 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 just isn't isn't the way uh, on which uh, through which things should be dealt dealt with. Uh, without a real involvement of, of, of citizens, of Bosnian, of Bosnian citizens. Uh, last and last but not least, I would also like to go back to this regional level and to give 
a sort of, of when it comes really to the region and not individu individual countries, uh, and also what IFES in the region uh, constantly emphasizes and that's put forward by Ingelhardt, is that the fundamentals first approach is, uh, in my opinion, uh, inseparable from the socio-economic sta status of the society. So people, uh, besides these bigger constitutional questions, with, which I mentioned uh, uh, on, a, on the example of, 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 of Bosnia, must be, must be satisfied with their socio-economic status in order to be able to improve society and uh, democratize it. The, the, uh, democratize, uh, democratize it, sorry. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, in my opinion, uh, EU requirements uh, must contain a uh, social dimension in order for all countries of the Western Balkans region that are still in the process of, of Euro integration to, to essentially go through reforms and uh, not to take the technocratic uh, uh, way, uh, if, if we can say that. So, so uh, basically, just put it, I will put it very bluntly. So technocratic elites are in fact just an extension of, of, political, of political elites that exist in every uh, system and they are replaced after some tectonic changes in the political system. But as Florian mentioned uh, in, in the case of the, of, the, of the Western Balkans region, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, a big, always a big question what happens next, so to say, uh, after one, uh, or, you know, or one, one regime is, is put, put down or, 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 you know, or, uh, yeah, his, uh, the time of the, of the regime is, 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 uh, has ended, so to say. So, um, yeah, uh, basically, I, I, I was, I, I tried to be very brief, I didn't really have much time to, to, to I actually wanted to do a bigger presentation. But uh, I think, I think you, I hope that, uh, you know, everybody got, 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 got the point and that we can uh, discuss, discuss this topic. And the, that what I mentioned uh, later, later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Harun uh, uh, Okay, from Bosnia, we will go to the eternal candidate for EU negotiations, uh, Republic of North Macedonia. Um, Alexander Kajalovsky is, uh, as I mentioned, is the director of the Macedonian Center for International Cooperation, uh, one of the biggest uh, organizations in the country, a civil organization and a foundation. Uh, if I'm uh, wrong, correct me, please. Alexander, and he, 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 he has been um, uh, deciphering the Macedonian society for, for long years uh, in the framework of the Macedonian Center for International um, Cooperation. So please, Alexander, now give us, give us some kind of feedback what is happening under the surface. So officially, um, officially, let's say, we're Macedonia as a country which uh, is about to start. Okay, I'm, I, I, I cannot ignore my own cynicism, but anyway, about to start the negotiations uh, uh, is not considered as a capture state at, at this moment. What is happening below the surface and how are citizens, ordinary citizens, citizens or clients uh, to the system, how do they perceive the, the situation? Okay, thank you, Gordon. And uh, let me also thank the Institute and Katarina personally for inviting me to speak on this uh, panel. And in the beginning, let me also kind of excuse myself as I'm not much of an academic, but rather pragmatic uh, person. And uh, that is also the, most of the work that MCIC does is of that kind. However, Katarina pers is persuading me that some of the analysis that we do and in, in research reports are coming close to an academic standards. <laughs> and are useful anyway. Uh, so uh, one of them that is uh, one on corruption uh, uh, found its place in the document that is basis for this discussion. So I may, I'll mainly refer to that in, in my address. Even uh, later, uh, perhaps I will also uh, give some of my thoughts on, the, on your questions as well. 
Another reason for for uh, for my role today is that I appreciate the the institute's work on depolarization in the country that that we partially support uh, through the civic mobility uh, program of the Swiss Embassy. As I strongly agree with your assessment, that uh, is indeed one of the major obstacles uh, for our development towards uh, EU integration. Though I'm I'm less optimistic than 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 you two are about. Uh, prospects of, uh, of healing that disease about the polarization and also about the prospects to to EU integration in the in the uh, coming forward uh, but also this is not uh, particularly uh, specific to Macedonia I think that, that global tendencies tendencies and the social media role in it is is, is also crucial and is visible all over the world just take United States as, a, as an example. Furthermore, I, will, I also fully agree with the Institute analysis on the role of the administration in achieving, or, or better said so far, not achieving EU standards. And uh, uh, I assume also that uh, I was invited here today, as I frequently say on TV, that the public administration in Macedonia should be reduced not by 20% as the, the ruling party pledged in their election campaign this summer, but uh, by half at least uh, or even more and as much as the time passes and i read more reports like uh, like uh, this of the institute or our that i will refer to shortly i'm even more convinced that uh, now we need pretty radical surgery to 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 to, to make it effective uh, a service as both uh, these studies uh, show what we talk about today the link of the ineffective uh, public administration to the tendencies of illiberalism and authoritarian uh, regimes. Uh, so finally, let's uh, uh, say that last argument uh, why I see myself in this, uh, this panel is one of the main reasons is uh, also to further support Institute efforts in decapturing the, the state. Uh, I would, even if you say it is not used much anymore, I don't think we are, we have moved much of the, of the state capture that was the case, and I'll show some examples of that in the in my address uh, based on our research. Uh, and uh, I I think MCC fits in in that part too because we were among the first ones to use the state capture phrase in a, in a title of one of our conferences down in 2015, uh, way before EU used it in in their uh, official report for the first time. Uh, not that I was I was pro using that uh, that phrase at that time, but uh, four of my colleagues persuaded me to do so, and I, I'm glad uh, we did. Uh, although it meant uh, automatically um, cancellation of participation of one 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 minister and one deputy at at that time. So this is more to give a picture from what perspective I'm, I'm coming and I'm speaking for for most of the uh, participants. So after this rather long intro. Let me focus on the highlights of, of MCC work that was main reason to include me today. And it is the uh, corruption assessment report, or as we jokingly call it, uh, TSAR, <laughs> with this abbreviation. And it is continuous effort of the uh, so-called SELDI network uh, on anti-corruption in the Balkan region to systematically and thoroughly monitor level of corruption in the, in the Balkan countries. And also, although it also uses uh, the public opinion surveys, uh, thus measuring perception uh, per se, uh, it, uh, it goes a bit deeper than uh, the popular transparency international corruption perception index that was out uh, just recently, a few days ago, as it analyzes also victimology, uh, uh, meaning uh, uh, people ask also how often they were uh, asked for a bribe or uh, or they gave uh, gave bribe as as like those are the indexes of corruption pressure or, or corruption resistance uh, so it gives a bit deeper uh, picture of the of the state of corruption in the in the society than the perception itself though uh, i can confirm uh, that we are also making another one and will be out soon in uh, later this month even or or in march 
and uh, in in most of the countries it uh, reconfirms the transparency international index or it's even worse so the the real situation is even worse than what uh, the index says about the corruption in the in the balkan uh, countries i think it's half half we are on the same level and uh, and in the half countries it is uh, worse than uh, than it is in uh, transparency index so I would uh, let me say uh, something about the research itself. I've mentioned uh, uh, takes uh, does look at the perceptions, uh, but uh, first focuses more on on experiences of, of citizens, personal experiences, whether they gave uh, gave bribe or or uh, was asked uh, for for a bribe, uh, and thus uh, uh, that is one of the main indicators that uh, that I will focus on. But also other aspects are uh, corruption attitudes. So one is experiences, second is attitudes, and only third part is uh, corruption perceptions. Under attitudes, we, we mean uh, awareness of, uh, of corruption, acceptability or tolerance towards corruption, and that's, that's uh, why I gave the title of, of my presentation uh, as such, Culture of Corruption and Administration. And uh, finally, susceptibility, how resistant we are uh, or susceptible to to corruption as citizens, and the third part is uh, is about uh, perceptions. Uh, so let me jump to to the actual results. And uh, as I'm, uh, I said, I'm not that much academic, but uh, also as my educational background is rather uh, engineering and, and computer science, I'll refer to, uh, to numbers more than than uh, words. Uh, so. Uh, what I can say about uh, corruption pressure or how much how, of, how often citizens were asked to give a bribe uh, it, uh, it fluctuates in Macedonia between uh, between 25 and 35 percent which basically means that every third citizen uh, is asked uh, for a bribe and uh, what is even more problematic that uh, one in four, 25% uh, around uh, in uh, in recent years actually gave uh, so the, the, there was no big resistance toward toward corruption when when you are asked for you you actually uh, do that uh, compare that to to other uh, aspects that we follow for example how many uh, persons are actually uh, convicted of of a bribe it was never above 25 persons per year. Uh, and in the recent years, uh, 2015 uh, uh, towards uh, this year, is less than 10 per year. Which means if we co compare these two things, uh, uh, that uh, basically only two to three people in 10,000 cases of, of lower petty corruption or administrative corruption are, are actually punished for, for, for that. And now to illustrate such uh, behaviors. I can give an example from uh, my colleagues or friends for, that I have in construction sector that are dealing with the public administration. And uh, they say to build an average uh, building, let's say five, six floors with 20, 30 flats, uh, it takes up to 100 documents that you need to, to, to receive from the public administration permissions and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, from different uh, administrative authorities, I, I would put in as these authorities. Uh, so it uh, and they say it takes an average of 100 euro per per document to speed up the procedure. So if you uh, if you don't uh, give a bribe of of that amount, uh, it will take at least 15 days for one single document uh, at least, and that is the maximum. Uh, procedural time, so every administrative officer will use maximum of the time that is given to actually uh, uh, do that, uh, or in order to speed up the procedure, you, you just give that uh, that hundred euros uh, and uh, get the the, the 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 work done. Huh? That is anyway uh, they have to do it. Uh, but uh, if you look at from a that ending is ending up between 10 and 10 and 20 thousand euros per uh, co for a company to, to pay in bribes to, to make that uh, that uh, building uh, constructed. But is also a difference between two and three years of uh, construction time and over five years of construction time if you, if you don't do that. So from the point of view of uh, 
of company, there is economic logic to actually sacrifice this uh, 1% of the cost of the of the building itself to actually make it faster and, and, and get you and get the investment back. From the point of view of, of civil servants, though, I think it's this important because it links to the, this culture of, of, of corruption, and how it links, links and, uh, and actually uh, intensifies uh, authoritarian uh, uh, proceedings in the country. Uh, two or three or up to four such bribes is already above their monthly salary. So in a situation that where, where, which I mentioned that where they're hardly prosecuted, uh, not that just they are not in, intensified to ask for uh, and receive a bribe, but even more they're not motivated even to do their job or to actually go and check uh, what they need to check to issue the document. So it's uh, uh, adding to the to the to the whole uh, system. Uh, uh, of, uh, of corruption that is uh, uh, later on uh, increasing authoritarian uh, behavior. So to go to the, uh, we noted that I've started using the term administrative corruption. So that is the formulation that we use in the in the report. In the report, we use state capture for higher level corruption, politicians or, or state-owned companies or monopolies. However, I tend to agree more with the Institute uh, linking the phrase state capture much more powerful with this administrative corruption as I find it more dangerous as it affects many more people or is visible to many more people thus enforcing their attitudes toward corruption eventually their perception to the widespread, uh, widespread corruption. So to briefly uh, mention uh, and come to a, to a closure uh, also to the other two aspects of, of the report that we make. One is uh, the attitudes, and that uh, measures accept acceptability or tolerance towards corruption. And it, in Macedonia, it's between 40 and 50 uh, percent. It is my minority opinion, but it's still very, fa very high. An alarming factor is that it is higher among younger population. I'll come to, to in the conclusions to that, what we can expect. Uh, on susceptibility for corruption, that means whether one is keen on bending certain or discard certain principle or your own value system in the given circumstances, if you're asked for a bribe or you need to do to pay something as a bribe to, to do some, some work done. Uh, around 40% of population are, are susceptible. Additional 30 are kind of partly susceptible given the circumstances and only 30% are firmly non-susceptible or say they will never do that uh, if it uh, violates their own uh, value system. And finally, for further and last indicator in this uh, round is awareness for corruption, which practically means or measures probability for involvement in corruption. And unfortunately, the majority of populations uh, or 60% believe that they will be at some point asked to to give a bread to, 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 to solve certain problem uh, in, uh, within the public administration. Uh, and to finalize the notions deriving from this report, uh, uh, just to mention the last two indexes, and that is uh, uh, which are dealing with perception. One is probability to, to, uh, to deal with corruption and corruption spread. And both of them are not good, neither optimistic. That's why I'm also. Uh, less optimistic than my, than my colleagues. And then whopping 84% of people in Macedonia don't believe that the corruption pressure will decrease. And that is linked to these uh, notions with the, or experiences with the public administration. And that is, uh, that is more even than a few years ago than from the Gruyevsky regime that we, that, we, that we mentioned often today. Uh, but also 66% uh, of uh, citizens think that uh, that public officials and administrations are involved in, in corruption. And finally, only 20% or 5% of citizens think that corruption in Macedonia can be reduced and only five that it can, it can be eradicated. So it's grand, uh, uh, that is telling uh, you why I am not very optimistic. So to, to summarize or conclude, I, I do think this study confirms uh, the, the, the report of, uh, made by the, the Institute. 
uh, that I think widespread corruption at, at, on administrative level is adding to this uh, uh, captured state uh, notion, let's say, especially in the public administration, is adding to the problem of our EU accession and in the respecting the EU values uh, per se. So for me, obviously, drastic uh, measure or even radical changes uh, are needed, even more than what uh, institutes suggest in, in their study. Uh, however, this data that I have presented uh, indicate that it will be difficult to expect such a change and then uh, basically confirms largely social tolerance uh, so, uh, for it and also related to that the behavior of the public administration uh, and thus uh, to, to thrive of the authoritarian uh, uh, systems. So uh, I'll uh, let me say, uh, stop uh, here and, uh, and reflect maybe later in the discussion on, on some of the other points that, uh, that, uh, that were raised. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Alexander Kajalski, uh, for these uh, really devilish details, uh, which again confirm, confirm actually the, the thesis that. Uh, uh, that good leg legislation with bad implementations is, 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 is a concept coined in some political laboratories and it doesn't make any sense in decapturing, in real de decapturing of the society, let's say. Uh, as uh, Professor Bivel said that the, the state capture, especially in the Western Balkans, go, goes along with the EU integration. They go hand in hand, the case of Vucic, the case of Gruevski, etc., etc. Maybe in this kind of uh, uh, getting into details, we we actually uh, unravel the, the the real the real the real essence of the uh, of what is called institutional resistance to a change and legacies of non-democratic behavior. If you want, kind of a political culture which uh, which which thrived in the region and it's it's, it's not bound to change uh, uh, very easily. Uh, but let's go to the real devil. Uh, uh, we have everything here, Dante, etc., etc. The European illiberalism from micro to uh, macro. Uh, Nicola Milanese uh, will present on the topic, which is he is a founding director of the European Alternatives, which has been campaigning and organizing for, trans, for transnational democracy for over a, a decade. He has published uh, numerous articles and books. Uh, the one uh, it is no, which is not mentioned uh, uh, in the biography is called The Citizens of Nowhere. I don't know if it's published, Nicolo, uh, but I, I, I took a glimpse of, uh, of, of, uh, of the aspects you are dealing with uh, uh, in this book. So please, please take the floor. Thanks very much, uh, Gordon. And what an introduction to say to come to the real devil. Uh, the, the, and of course, that's 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 my <laughs> own fault. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm thrilled to be here. You you speak his name, and the 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 reason I chose this title: um, devilish details and levels of the inferno, European liberalism from micro to macro, is is also inspired by the. The report that you that you circulated and and Katerina and I have spoken about this methodology in the past, which I very much admire of um, starting with the citizens lived experience and what might seem a small example uh, to then draw out implications for a whole system. Um, uh, that's also a kind of methodology for investigating European liberalism that Katerina and I have tried to foster in, a, in an edited volume that will hopefully appear uh, in the coming, coming months or next year. Um, so what I want to do here is, is, is to sort of um, take a bit of a macro view and then come to what I see as one of the significations of the Macedonian case, the North Macedonian case, uh, when it comes to these questions of European democracy. Um, and, uh, and so to start with, with, with really quite macro um, considerations, I wanted to underline two dogmas, which I think that the past couple of years of common experience in Europe ought to have 
taught us to uh, dispense with, but, but probably many people haven't uh, really thought that through. The first dogma is, is this idea that um, captured states or a liberal democracy or um, whichever term you want to use is really a kind of Eastern European uh, disease or, or, or something which is a Eastern exceptionalism or whether it's the Eastern or Balkan or whatever. But this kind of explanation is, is a dogma that really ought to be um, thrown out now um, for, for, all kinds of, for all kinds of reasons. But if you want to take a really uh, straightforward way of looking at things, look at countries that were held up as bastions of liberal values, like the United Kingdom um, or France, the country I'm sitting in right at the moment. There are all kinds of illiberal authoritarian symptoms apparently in these countries um, attempting to close down or actually effectively closing down the parliaments in the United Kingdom uh, in the case of Boris Johnson proroguing parliaments in the, in, in the Brexit debates or in, in France where, where I currently am attempted reforms of the police which severely would limit um, the, the possibilities of journalists to cover what the police are doing or uh, for, for decades now, thoroughly illiberal treatment of uh, migrants and asylum seekers. So on. the examples are, are numerous and are well known. Um, and they suggest that illiberal democracy is um, not so much a specific cultural trait, uh, which might be associated one, with one part or another of the European continent or European peoples, but rather um, a kind of uh, effect of a dysfunctional international system, which political actors are able to exploit in illiberal ways in different contexts. That's of course not to say that uh, there's not specificities in the way that that happens and different degrees to which it happens. Of course, there is a Macedonian specificity uh, in the way that the state may have been captured and there are different degrees to which uh, democracy is compromised but as as Florian also said at the beginning this is a matter of of degrees and we would we would really be uh, mistaken not to see the overall uh, macro pattern so that was the first dogma no more eastern except exceptionalism and uh, that has implications for the way that the European Union and the European institutions think about the questions of uh, European fundamental values, for example, which have had, has been largely discussed these past couple of years, uh, because most of you will know that the attempts to formulate what are European values in an explicit way uh, came really as a preoccupation after 1989 and Eastern enlargement, the prospect of Eastern enlargement. We need to somehow formulate what are these values that these exceeding countries are supposed, are supposed, to, um, supposed to, to, to match up to. Um, so the, the attempt at formulating the values and this idea of uh, Eastern European exceptionalism kind of uh, went at the same time. And prior to that date, when it came to thinking about values and citizens' rights, there was much more concern about whether uh, the European Union itself might actually be infringing on uh, citizens' rights. So, and so I think one of the consequences of getting rid of this dogma of an Eastern European exceptionalism is to acknowledge that there are these, there's the potential for these kinds of authoritarian illiberal uh, symptoms anywhere in, in and around Europe. Um, and moreover, we need to keep in our, keep as an open question all the time, whether the European Union itself might also be infringing on uh, various kinds of uh, rights and values. Um, so that, that's the first uh, dogma. The second dogma, is, is uh, connected in my mind, but it is the dogma which is still very much present in uh, a lot of social and political sciences, but also in public debate, of separating out European affairs and domestic affairs, as if these two things were totally different spheres of, um, of, of political activity uh, and, and, and of scientific investigation. Now, in countries like North, uh, North Macedonia, of course, the, the European perspective has been very present in, 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 in domestic affairs for years, but in other countries, 
inside the European Union, there's, there's been a kind of tendency to assume that um, domestic affairs and European affairs are, are two different things. In the past two decades of crises amongst, uh, just to limit ourselves to that, have really shown to everybody that European affairs are um, directly related to your everyday concerns um, as a citizen in any country, increasingly connected to uh, the budgetary capabilities of your state um, and, and, and every kind of question. And so European affairs and international uh, and domestic affairs have become uh, thoroughly imbricated. And um, here's the point, most of the um, illiberal tendencies which, which emerge take a position in this question of the relationship between domestic affairs and European affairs. This is a thematic which is constantly mobilized uh, by, uh, whether it be on the right, as it were, by people like Orban or Salvini or, or so on, this drawing on sovereignist uh, uh, and xenophobic notions, or whether it be on um, supposedly the other side, the, the people who claim to be defending uh, liberal values um, like President Macron, uh, but actually under the cover of, of a kind of European flag, cover over all kinds of illiberal practices in, in the state. This relationship with uh, European politics is uh, a crucial thematic to really understand the nature of a liberal symptoms in, uh, in Europe. And it's actually the reason why I, I, I think that there is something we can call specifically European illiberalism, because in every case of these symptoms, there's always the aspect of the relationship with the European Union, uh, but it plays out differently in each, in each time. So that also speaks to what has already been mentioned about the sy sy symbiotic relationship uh, between state capture and EU integration as, as a specific way that this dialectic plays out in the, in, in, in the Balkans and in the accession countries. So I think we have to get rid of this dogma, dogma of, the, of the distinction between European affairs, the neat distinction between European affairs and domestic affairs. Now, I think as a consequence of getting rid of these two uh, dogmas, it, it, it means when we think about these issues, uh, stopping with uh, a, a kind of piecemeal approach to understanding um, the nature of political transformations in our, in our societies. Um, and so that means constantly relating individual details to a much larger <clears throat> picture of what is going on. Um, and that is something which the political institutions um, and notably the European Union, are peculiarly badly prepared to, uh, to do. It's the nature of a technocracy to want to compartmentalize uh, facts and phenomena into different uh, distinct domains and not to be able to uh, properly uh, make a synthesis and an overall evaluation. It's also um, the nature unfortunately, of uh, legal approaches to addressing problems in um, the undermining of democracies that typically one has to look at uh, specific instances of, for example, changing a constitution or making a media law and not make uh, systemic judgments about how a whole system is being undermined or transformed. That's the reason why, um, scholars like uh, um, um, gosh let me try and remember her, her name Kim Lane Shepler for example um, are calling for the European Court of Justice to be able to make more systemic judgments about um, the nature of undermining a democratic system in countries like Hungary or Poland uh, but as has been pointed out uh, also in this discussion already law is going to have, uh, law itself has some limitations in the degree of a holistic approach it can take. Um, it can't reach down all the way into 
uh, practices and the ethos of a regime. Um, and so law also needs to be conscious of its own limitations, just as uh, the European institutions need to be conscious of their own limitations. And that leads me to my um, final, final point in a way, which is that um, part of finishing with a piecemeal approach to uh, promoting democracy or, or developing democracy is to appreciate that um, perhaps the fundamental problem uh, for the European Union and its relationship with uh, its neighboring countries is what I would perhaps bombastically call a, a crisis of positive liberty, which is to say that um, you can try to reinforce the surveillance aspects of democracy as much as you want. What, what Pierre Rosenvalon calls counter democracy, surveillance democracy, increase transparency, increase the capacity of the uh, law courts to monitor the system, increase the possibility of citizens to uh, object to things, but you're not, uh, it, all of that is coming on the side of negative liberty. Uh, and none of it is reinforcing the possibility of democratic agency to propose things. And this is where I think that the Macedonian case is really uh, crucial because um, in, in the case of North Macedonia, it, one of the crucial questions is what is the relationship of all of these processes we've been talking about with something that was called the colorful revolution, which uh, after all, um, and, and, and there, there will be all kinds of uh, uh, subtle readings of, of that event in the, in, in the room as it were, but one aspect of it has to be about an expression of positive agency for change. And it is striking that um, that kind of positive agency for change is exactly what gets um, evaporated out of, cut out of uh, any kind of European Union process. Um, and indicative of that to me is, is perhaps what is a detail, but I think it really speaks to um, the point I'm trying to make that as you will all know, the European Union for a couple of years now has been talking about launching a conference on the future of Europe as a way of addressing its own democratic shortcomings. Um, that conference has been delayed because of the pandemic and because of other reasons, but now, now it's likely to kick off on the 9th of May this year. But almost at no point in, um, in, in discussions about what that conference ought to look like, has it been suggested that, for example, the citizens of North Macedonia might have a say in what the future of Europe ought to look like? And yet, it's an accession country. I mean, if, if the future of Europe is about anything, it's also about the, the, the future expansion of the European Union. But it's not even, a, it's, it's not as if it's a suggestion that has been rejected. It's not even a question uh, for um, the, the people who are trying to plan this exercise in thinking, supposedly civic exercise in thinking about the future of Europe. And so there seems to be a, a, a huge gap uh, where civic voice, as, as, uh, as um, we could perhaps call it, it, it is, supposed, is supposed to be. And I think that one of the consequences of one of the conclusions of your report really uh, is going in the direction of saying that you can, you can change the laws as many times as you want. Um, but that's really not, that's not where all the action is. The action is also about the civic ethos and agency of uh, the citizens. And so in a certain sense, it is the denial of that, which I think is perhaps the, the most important devilish detail or right at the, uh, at the center of the inferno. And that's what we need to sort of grasp, grasp hold of. So uh, I leave it there. Thank you very much, Katrina, for your hand. <laughs> um, so, so we're going to get into the discussion right on. Just, just a, one note on on this Eastern exceptionalism. Uh, Nicole, we were struggling here for 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 years to to 
in addressing our friends in the European Union to make them understand that actually this is not an Eastern exceptionalism, but it is uh, related to, to all the others, other, other aspects that we, we know and then actually we discussed uh, today, especially uh, William Bieber. But now that, the, that, the, that we are officially in front of the gate, that officially it's not an European exceptionalism, we don't know what to do with that. Before that, it was, it was more interesting in a way. Uh, we, were, uh, we were trying to, 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 to construct a di dialogue with, uh, uh, with the European Union in order to curb or in order to, to address this exceptionalism. Now that uh, it's inside the European Union, it's not any more exceptional. Um, the values are, are, are really debatable, the values we are heading towards and the values uh, nurtured in the very uh, sense of the European Union. Uh, uh, the, the countries of the Western Balkans are really confused, let's say, not, not talking about the leaders. The leaders are, um, are repeating the mantra about the European Union, but the, the very citizens, I mean, look at the case of Macedonia. We're talking about, uh, uh, now, now the European Union is saying us that actually on the level of the reforms, as, uh, as Katarina would say, we have uh, good laws, but bad implementations, but we have to deal with the language and identity issue with Bulgaria. For God's sake, so it it, it, it uh, postures a real confusion in the minds of the citizens, and from this point on, I don't know where, where we can we can find each other with the with the European Union's uh, uh, principle. Let's say uh, just a short comment and then move. On. Okay, Katarina, please, uh, you are you are the first one who raised the hand. Uh, please join us in the discussion. Yeah, um, I mean. Unless the speakers have, you know, some comments to exchange among themselves, uh, I can ask a question. I simply raise my hand so that, uh, you know, I take my spot for for the next session when we uh, next part of the session when we uh, start with the Q and A, the classical Q and A. But we also envisage the section where you know the speakers would exchange among themselves. So. Should I go and uh, exchange comments? Uh, should I go ahead and comment and then uh, leave the speakers exchange and, uh, comments among themselves and then move to the Q and A, or should I wait? Just immerse, just immerse okay. in the discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, so it might help uh, the kick off the discussion uh, among them, among the speakers as well. So. Um, my question is mainly uh, um, addressed to Florian. It's uh, it's simply a question, but I would uh, like to, before posing the question, I would like to comment to Alexander's uh, presentation. Once again, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, the Institute uh, for the research they are doing because uh, uh, it's one of the rare, if not the only study in the country in the past years that demonstrates that the impression we have, especially during Gruevsky period, if you remember uh, uh, the public here, even the EU Brussels had uh, uh, the impression that, yeah, uh, Gruevsky might be slightly authoritarian, but uh, there is no corruption. He has eradicated corruption and the state is, is functioning smoothly, at least uh, as a public sector. So uh, that was the general um, uh, impression back then. And uh, now uh, with the research you have done recently, uh, uh, it becomes clear that we were even back then far from it. If uh, the response of the you know, normal, uh, regular public, not uh, the respondents of Transparency International, you know, the elites, they consult these are uh, the regular people that you asked. Uh, their perception is uh, so, you know, worrisome. And it means that it was like that even back then. Uh, so uh, we published a, a study, the Institute published a study called technology of state capture toward the end of, uh, um, you know, the shorter uh, version was called technology of state capture uh, in 2015 and in 2014, we uh, published again, uh, a, a study, a more comprehensive, a bigger one, uh, again, uh, using the title uh, state capture, but 
I would like to explain in what way and uh, in what, what way we use the term and then refer to Florian and ask a question. And I might say, might, I must say that even back then, we quoted uh, one of your studies. You used it even earlier in 2013, but indeed it was uh, referring to high level corruption in, in the case of your analysis. We used it slightly differently and uh, in order to expand this definition and make it applicable specifically to this um, authoritarian post uh, socialist or states in transition, transitioning toward the EU for, for many decades now. Uh, so in the context of uh, what uh, later became uh, 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 illiberal democracy, I mean, it was in uh, circulation, the term uh, was in, cir in circulation even back then, but it was less popular than, for example, hybrid regimes or competitive authoritarianism. So we wanted to uh, offer a definition of this uh, phenomenon of, uh, of the method of governance called state capture within this context. So we uh, mainly derived the definition in, uh, from Andre Noskot's analysis back then. Uh, and uh, anyway, I, I'm uh, reaching the point where I can move on to, to the question. This intro is important for, uh, for the question itself. Uh, so uh, when we went uh, to, uh, Brussels to the European Policy Center to uh, explain our publication, uh, present and explain the, the premises of our publication, Technology of State Capture in 2015. Uh, it was very difficult. Once again, I'm repeating, it was very difficult to convince the people in Brussels that there is anything corrupt or wrong, except uh, in this legalistic sense, uh, in the way uh, Gruevsky governs, that some mild authoritarian uh, trace of governance or mannerism, uh, slightly right-wing populism, uh, isn't quite undemocratic, so everything is in order. So we had to demonstrate to them that the way the system of governance is set up, the way laws are, are produced is premised on a logic that goes contrary to any set of uh, founding or foundational values of the European Union. Uh, and uh, those values are, you know, at the, at the core, basically liberal. You know, they put the center, uh, the citizen at the center of, you know, of, uh, as the central value. Uh, so anyway, uh, the point is that the legislation does the opposite here. Uh, the way the, the, uh, the, the, the institution, uh, public sector is set up is the opposite here. Even if there were no corruption, none whatsoever, as it was assumed back, back then when Gruevsky was in power, we had to demonstrate that there is still state capture even though there is no corruption because that was the perception. Even we believed it uh, back then. Uh, so we had to use the term in the sense of this authoritarianism or let's put it uh, uh, simplify the the, the, uh, the definition or be a reductivist here excessive power of the executive branch over uh, the other two branches so we had to demonstrate that that's what was uh, going on uh, back then. So my, my point is, uh, let's imagine that there is no corruption whatsoever. Uh, there still would be state capture in this sense of the word, in, uh, and in the sense of the word uh, applicable to the liberal democracies, to Eastern European hybrid regimes, etc., consisting in this excessive power of the executive branch, which is perfectly legal. Let's also emphasize that fact. So if that is the case, 
that this authoritarianism is legal, is systemic. It's not an aberration, it's a foundation and uh, a, a premise upon which the entire model of governance relies. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, Florian uh, talked about. And I read his uh, book on the rise of authoritarianism in the region and uh, the mechanisms of uh, authoritarian governance. State capture was one of them. Uh, um, I concur with all he argues there. Uh, so my question is the following, basically. Uh, uh, making clear that I'm not using state capture as merely corruption. My uh, question is the following. What are these institutional legacies, according to you, as, um, as a philosophy of governance, perhaps, inbuilt in the legislation and the institutional uh, setup or structure. And um, therefore, what is this resistance, this institutional resistance to change? I tend to agree with this. And I think that this goes across all sorts of sectors in the society. We have been witness to this in the past year. I mean, basically everyone who is part of the public sector has resisted some, uh, let's say bold uh, reforms uh, under the uh, pretext of different uh, national paranoia. I'll, I'll explain uh, what I have in mind if, uh, if there is time. But the question is, what is this composition of institutional legacy, what does it consist of, which uh, enables this authoritarian inertia, and uh, why is this, is, and how does this actually institutional resistance to change play out? Okay. In what, uh, how does it manifest itself? Uh, the last okay. two are questions to fo Florian. Okay, uh, would you take them, uh, Florian, or you want you want us I, to get some? Okay, I'm, please. I'm comp I could go either way. I can either address Katarina's comments or, or uh, you know, uh, see yeah, if the other ones please, related. Please, you can you can take all of them. I mean, I think thanks, Katarina. I mean, this is. Uh, I think you're raising a couple of questions which I cannot answer so easily because they're difficult to answer. Um, I mean, I think there. Let me start with with, I think one element when you're talking about the resistance to change or transformation, I mean, of course, you can say in one side, it's uh, it's based structurally, you know, any institu institutions are generally reluctant to change. And then of course, within it, you have, you have informal institutions, right? So if you could consider the informality to be an institution as well, um, which, which uh, also has ways of doing things, which uh, are then, you know, reluctant to, to, to change. Um, and, and I think the other one is uh, it's the other side, which is, I think, important. And you mentioned it a little bit with, uh, with the, um, with the um, EU side as well, is that the European Union has conceptualized democracy in a highly technocratic way. And it kind of comes back to what Nicolo has been saying in his contribution um, as a set of rules and particular laws, how it's done. Um, and I've often said, and I still, I think it's, it holds true is that basically the, Euro e I mean, again, the EU is, 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 is a term we should maybe not use, but the institutions of the European Union and the way they conceptualize accession process have broken down democracy to so many institutional components and legal components that it's a collection of trees which don't make a forest. I mean, I've used this metaphor and I think, but I still think it, it works very well. So, you know, you have the, you have tons of trees, but the problem is, of course, we all know a difference between a fake uh, forest, you know, a forest which is made for chopping Christmas trees or making uh, paper, which is, you know, rows of trees without uh, the undergrowth, without the wildlife and so on. Um, um, mm. It still qualifies as a forest by the EU democracy in a certain way rules because it is based on, uh, a tree is growing in a certain direction, a certain height, in a certain number, but uh, the substance isn't what it is, uh, isn't a forest. And I think this is partly the problem. Now, why is this the case? Um, and and this, uh, I think there, 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 there are 
two reasons uh, primarily for this particular a certain way blind spot also of the European Union. One is, is, is that as an organization which is about, um, uh, which, is, which is very much rule based rather than kind of big picture based, has a hard time to define the big picture because, you know, uh, what does democracy look like in the European Union? You, you know, the strength of the EU is also its weakness. Democracy and rules in the EU look very different. I mean, and I mean it in a positive way. I mean, I'm saying that like, you could have all kinds of understandings of democracy compatible with the European Union. You can have a highly federal state, you can have a highly centralized state. You can have a king or a queen, or you can have a president. You can have a strong president, you can have a weak president. You can have, you know, there are many ways of understanding democracy. So it's hard to define it, but if you define it purely legally and institutionally, you kind of drop the normative and the kind of conceptual understanding. So if you operational, it's, it's the operationalization without the, 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 the kind of normative underpinnings are left unsaid because probably if you try to define them, they are very elusive. Um, so that's, I think, one of the weaknesses. And that is not fundamentally a problem if you're talking about countries which are, de which are democracies, which fit into this category in a, in a, in a way which is sustainable. But if they are not, then it's much more difficult because then you get this uh, fake forest, basically. The other element is that, of course, the EU enlargement process uh, was always conceptualized to be a process based on a fundamental societal and elite commitment to the European Union and democracy. I mean, again, one of the conditions for EU membership is, is, is the, you know, being in the European, in being in the European continent and being a democracy. Um, it's easy to assess whether the European continent, although you know by that criteria Cyprus should have not joined, but that's again a question of whether how we define uh, Europe geographically. But um, but it's the problem is that it assumes this commitment, um, and of course this might have worked in the particular the previous era, but the, there is a discrepancy between the you know of course formally everybody is a democrat, formally Putin is a democrat, right? Formally Erdogan is a democrat. I mean there's so it's it's based on an assumption that formal commitment to democracy is enough uh, because this was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the understanding in a, in a different era, but there is no mechanism to actually uh, question this self-understanding um, beyond the, the, the kind of, in a substantive way. And I think this is part of the structural weakness of the European Union, that it doesn't think about how, how, how democracy should work. Uh, um, um, and I mean, this brings me to one point I want to just kind of, um, you know, add to what Nicola is saying, which I appreciate very much, but also saying that, you know, the discussion about the future of Europe should involve the Western Balkan uh, societies very much because, again, they are, if they are not thought about as being part of the future of Europe, then, then there's a problem with the future of Europe as a conceptual, um, um, kind of conceptual framework. But I think it's just part of a larger problem that the, that the, um, the kind of attempts to have a larger vision or trying to create a larger debate um, have been have been very limited. I mean, even the discussion about the future of Europe in Europe doesn't seem to be all that uh, open or all that kind of, you know, uh, uh, all encompassing. And I think maybe it's to some degree the experience of the failed constitution, which still kind of lingers on in Europe about the, the kind of reluctance uh, to make a big discussion about Europe because there's a fear that it will be back, it will backfire. So better to not have a big discussion but of course, the end result is, of course, that you, it's a lack of kind of, there's a reluctance to engage in visions or like in this bigger picture. So there's a reluctance to think about the forest. Um, but I think to some degree, at the end, the European Union has to think more about, about the forest and less about the trees. And I mean, this is the other point is, is I'll, I'll wrap up with that as an answer, is that, you know, actually the the eu has been externalizing its uh, internal problems to a large degree so the kind of also skepticism you know the french skepticism towards accession talks with macedonia and albania and other measures are very much a, a function of the internal experiences in the european union but because you cannot address them within the eu so because there is a problem with hungary or not hungary with the government of hungary with the government of poland i mean they don't speak for the people necessarily um, or bulgaria or so on um, because you can't deal with them in the EU effectively, you're externalizing them because you could more easily deal with them in Macedonia and Serbia and uh, Albania because they are not, uh, they are not um, code co-shapers of the union. Um, and so in that sense, it's a lot easier to say, 
well, okay, we have a problem with the rule of law and democracy in the European Union, but we ha don't have the tools to deal with it within the EU. So to compensate for that, we're going to be much stricter to those who are not in yet. Um, but of course, the problem is you can be as strict as you want to. And I think this was, uh, was, was the point made is like the, the disease is in the European Union. So it's kind of like trying to prevent a problem which is already within you, right? So, so it's, you know, taking a COVID vaccine when you're already sick with COVID, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's in a certain way, um, instead of, and I think the better way to conceptualize it, I think this is where one has to change the narrative to say, okay, there's a problem within the EU and outside of the European Union. So it's best tackled together, but also best understood as a, as a common problem. So it's a problem, you know, the fact that you have commissioners who represent author, or, or who come from authoritarian regimes and also pursue their agenda. That's a problem just as much as you have competitive authoritarian regimes um, in the uh, in the uh, in the Western Balkans. And you know, the, these these regimes are contagious. I mean, you know, I think they're contagious within the European Union because you know they are representatives of the EU institutions to some degree. Um, who, who also have this, you know, the representative of, of Hungary and Poland, they're not just, you know, Hungarian citizens or Polish citizens, they're named by regimes which are not committed to democracy. And then they also will act accordingly in certain moments. Um, and so, so, and of course, we see the same thing with European party families, where European party families are, you know, I would say poisoned uh, from within by the presence of undemocratic parties, uh, you know, like the like Fidesz and, and the European People's Party, but also some of the members of the socialists have been uh, not exactly uh, doing a good job um, for the health of the, the progressives. So, and I think this, this, you know, in a certain way, one has to deal, uh, kind of push uh, the EU, I mean, the institutions, the parties to say there's a, there's a, there's a danger within you, um, you know, of authoritarianism, and it's not just an external one, which you can kind of shut out, but it's, it's, it's in a certain way much closer. And if you don't confront that, then you, you know, then it's not about just kind of keeping out those who are on the doorstep, so to speak. Sorry, just a bit digression. Uh, important. Sorry. Gurdan, can I just comment back on uh, uh, what the Florian said, just to observe a little bit more yeah. of the time? Uh, simply to clarify my question, it's, uh, uh, I'm riddled actually by, by, by this dilemma. I've been contemplating uh, about it. So, uh, and this is what I'm actually referring to. When you said uh, the institutional legacies that are resistance to change, you did not, I'm assuming, necessarily mean the political elites, the parties. Uh, it's a, it's an institutional set uh, setup. The the philosophy of the public sector, I would say. So, could we consider it as a political power in its own right, in a way that is resistant to change? Imagine if you had an avant-garde political progressive party that would want to introduce a, a serious, substantive change and reshape the public sector, would not uh, this sector or this institutional legacy show some serious resistance? Um, so is it a, a political power in and of itself that one should reckon with? Uh, uh, and why am I asking this? Um, Recently, there has been such a uh, strange opposition by, uh, by, I don't know, university professors, uh, I don't know, some me uh, media, uh, some journalists, uh, a huge chunk of the public toward uh, an educational reform in the country, which is so such a simple, normal, innocent thing. It's like, you know, it's about the introduction of uh, integrative interdisciplinarity. The idea is, you know, to move the country a little, up, a little bit upwards a little, uh, on the, this PISA, you know, ranking. Uh, and it has been spinned and in the public discourse in such way and also uh, what was used was the nationalist argument that uh, the Ministry of Education and uh, its consultants have cooked up this entire reform, imagine this complex process, to simply hide the fact that uh, our historiography will be revised in favor of the Bulgarian, 
historiography. So this has been uh, uh, a paranoid, utterly insane discourse. I have been trying to uh, uh, fight against the, okay, I'm talking in the singular, uh, first person singular, uh, because I've, I don't know, I'm one of the rare, I think, that has been defending this reform. Whereas this, you know, academic, the academics, uh, the Academy of Sciences, this established uh, professors at St. Cyril and Methodius, then some other very, very serious institutions or people uh, representing the public sector at high ranking positions were all demonstrated outrage toward the reform, and everybody was looking for this devil in the detail of the reform how it tries to smuggle in a different historiography that would concede to the Bulgarian historiography. Uh, I know it sounds insane, you know, like, you know, the uh, very <laughs> psychopathic, this entire uh, public discourse we have here, but this is the situation. And this time, it, it's not the government, it's not the political elites, it's a, a different force one is faced with. And it seems like, you know, it's a form of political power in and of itself. So why, what do you think about this observation of mine? And it's also, my point is, it's also incarnated in the public administration, primarily, I would say. I think, I mean, I wouldn't call it a force. It's, it's you know, I think there are different interest groups, uh, you know, in society and they're entrenched in institutions, like you said, academia in, in public administration. But I think, I mean, and this is what I, one thing which I always, I mean, I know Serbia better and I, I always found it interesting. Of course, you could say, you know, there's like the, the there's the, the, the partocracy, you know, public administration, the people who advance because of party membership and often not competent. And then you have the kind of conservative nationalist kind of uh, interest groups who, who in a certain way, uh, I think what you're describing seems to be more that kind of group of people who are, you know, seeing conspiracies and anti-nationalist uh, efforts and, and, uh, and so on. Um, and they might coincide with this kind of partyocracy, but they might also be dist distinct from them. And I mean, we've also seen this with the debate about the name change and uh, the, con the, the controversies in Macedonia with some intellectuals providing very dubious arguments. I mean, you know, one can have different views about it, but the kind of conspiratorial thinking and, 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 and also uh, uh, uninformed positions from academics was quite shocking, I heard, in, in Macedonia as well. Um, mm -hmm. And the same we have in Serbia and elsewhere. But I think these are different... I think one also has to think about them as different, that the, the kind of the entrenched party loyalists need not be the same as the conservative nationalists. I mean, from a, from a kind of conventional way of thinking about, you know, also what I was trying to challenge the paradigms, they fit together. It's like, oh yeah, it's like the nationalist uh, party guys who are resisting change. But I think we often find when we see this moment is that they're actually distinct different groups um, who might, you know, if they come together, then you have a particularly nasty mixture, <laughs> but, but they do mm -hmm. exist separately. And, and, um, and so in a certain way, you know, it means that, you know, and, uh, dealing with, with you know, there, there's, there's state capture and then there's this kind of, let's say, uh, you know, low trust, high na nationalism uh, mindset, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know, which we have elsewhere as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not singling out any particular country, but it, the, the level of which it's entrenched and also powerful actor, but I wouldn't say it's a singular actor. These are more like coalitions um, which form and which, mm -hmm. you know, can be very powerful when they're or focusing on a particular issue like the one you mentioned when it comes to whether you know the issue of the conflict with Bulgaria then mobilizes these groups quite strongly and then they can they can't they can't deal with Bulgaria so they find an outlet I guess in the issue of this particular reform we find this especially with educational reform I mean uh, academia tends to be one of them unfortunately not just in, in Macedonia but elsewhere uh, one of the more conservative um, um, groups than you know as one sure. would be more conservative than one would expect, in fact. True, true. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kazalski, please. Yeah, short comment or the reflection on this debate. I would actually call it a power, and I, will, I agree with that there is many different mixtures of interests and, and that combined make a actually strong force and power. And I will relate it to the businesses because uh, on MBA, this is learned as, uh, uh, let's say, purchases or, uh, or uh, uh, buyer's power. So even we have a power 
not to buy or buy a mobile phone, but the mobile phone has the power to make changes that to make you buy it uh, by another model. But also as a, as a buyers, we or in this case, instead people in the administration, they have actually quite a, a power, and that is reflected in in very in various uh, ways. Po political party membership significantly in, especially in our case, perhaps in the Balkan countries as well, as loyalty to the party contributes to this, but this is sometimes very uh, elemental. Let's say I know persons in, uh, that we cooperate in the, in the public administration that are just taking as many jobs as possible in order not to lose the job and then blocking everything because they cannot finish the, 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 all the tasks that they are responsible uh, for and, and, and similar. But uh, in essence, it is quite a strong power in our case, especially when it grew up to 130,000 people. So it's, uh, it's quite a power now. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have another comment on the, the future of the, the region? Maybe a little bit uh, having in mind the, the current turmoils which are bound to stay, let's say. I'm talking about the relations about the European Union and the, and the region. There's no future, okay. Uh, okay, if there, uh, let me say just in the chat. Okay, dear colleagues. Okay, uh, if there are no further comments, uh, uh, we can we can we can wrap up this uh, panel, which is uh, which, which will never end in the sense that uh, these um, aspects we are dealing with. Uh, are fundamental, are underlying, uh, they're they are bound to stay and we will confront them in the future. Uh, especially it will be interesting if, if at some point uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the region of Western Balkans being informed formally or informally by the European Union that actually we need to find, uh, we, we need to be getting uh, other types of integration regional, uh, regional, individual, etc, etc. But then we will discuss that when it comes, if it comes. Um, okay, uh, Katarina, I think we can wrap the, the, the panel. Uh, thank you very much for, for the panelists, uh, uh, for Harun Cero, Nicola Milanese, Alessandra Kajalski and uh, Florian Bieber. Uh, thank you for the participants. Uh, hope to see you again in uh, in these types of panels, hopefully live uh, at some point in our lives. Uh, it's far from certain when, when it will happen. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks for coming. See you again. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Katarina. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye again.